prescribe a model based upon pure data perspectives without having to draw on any additional inference. But it seems like true cognitive ability relies on both because I take past inferences and data that I've collected in reality to make fur future predictions on outcomes based on both like we're that. We're partially regularized, right? So we're partially, partially regularized based upon our own inferences. Right. So we, we make decisions, we see the impact of the decisions we make, and then we experience cognitive distance. That is the difference between what we expected to happen when we made the decision and what actually happened. That distance drives the plasticity. It literally causes us to evaluate our own beliefs and underlying decision-making processes so that we would then adjust our our model and our behavior, right? So it's effectively error backpropagating into the system. So both sides work the same way, right. right? So it's the idea of error propagation. But from one perspective, it's simply a pure bulk of volume information. Right. Whereas the AI perspective says that individual anecdotal anecdotal examples can actually drive that process. One new experience can cause you to challenge your framework right. in the AGI, the strong AI space. One new example is not necessarily been strong enough to pull you off your biases in the traditional ML framework. Is there a way to maybe merge the two and have one as a feedback loop to build a data, its own that's data what, set to what predict? That's what the LLMs are doing. LLMs drive. Large language models are doing that? Large language models something called attention frameworks. And those attention frameworks have a certain amount of feedback based upon their own internal constructs. Okay. So those framework ideas are pivotal right. in the underlying system. I would say, conceptually, I think the solutions lie kind of in a merger between the two. I don't think machines will ever be able to totally think the way we do. Right. But I also don't think that there is a complete, um, I don't think we can have something that is so totally alien to us and uh, trust it. <laughs> I just, it seems like we need to almost start off like we raise our children because they're basically a blank slate AI when they're born. You know, and they have inherent programming. I mean, some, they, they have, have a capacity, framework. They have the capacity for language accumulation. They're hardwired to recognize faces. So the brain itself is hardwired to acquire and recognize facial structures. It's incentivized to look at and process those features. So I think those things where it's like they're sort of a rules-based system, right. that's the firmware or the hard, I guess you'd say the hardware portion of it, right? The mm -hmm. hardware itself, the firmware substructure of it. Hardware builds out and then the firmware instructs the hardware how to operate. Mm -hmm. That is inherent in the developmental process of the structure. The software is all of the behavioral norms that get implemented via that structure. That was the weird, that's the weird part about that idea of like what becomes, what becomes true free will, right? True free will is the ability to sort of drive for making decisions for immediate gratification, even though they may not necessarily pursue the highest extents and goals. So it's a question of where we put measurable, specific and measurable goals, right? Specific, measurable, actionable goals as part of that first paradigm of making smart decisions. That kind of, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the framework that's the most important, I guess you'd say, for, for setting up some of the parameterization. So this actually is going to be a, a bit of a divergent discussion, but not one that's going to be so totally different than what we were discussing. But I think having it in its own little box that's encapsulated will be nice. What we've been wanting to do with reduction of feature numbers, right? So we've been wanting to reduce the dimensionality of our underlying decision-making frame. Initially, we utilized a sort of arbitrary method of, of including or excluding specific characteristics of the individual in order to include them within the system or exclude them in the system. This follows, this makes sense with us with respect to the way we think, right? We, we characterize, we put specific characteristics in line with our recognition of individuals or recognition of groups of individuals. But we want to also understand 
how the data we're given influences those decisions. There's an interesting part of this. So one of the reasons why I tried to group all of the feature uh, and dimensionality reduction characteristics, those early ones, with uh, cross-validation is because those are really cross-validation driven, right? We notice Lambda is available by doing cross-validation and increasing the size of Lambda and finding the optimal adjustment between initial overfitting, in which we have too many features, right? And eventually an optimal level of penalty for the inclusion of unnecessary features, right? We know a feature is unnecessary when, when its inclusion adds more to error than it helps in developing the model. So it adds more, it weighs the system down more with respect to the inclusion of that feature than it actually reduces RSS. So if adding a feature doesn't actually help with refining our understanding of the system, then what, what are we doing? We're wasting time, right? We're increasing dimensionality for a diminishing return. The bootstrap is an interesting process that follows a slightly different pattern of artificial data set construction. It is not a training-based methodology. Similarly to how KFOL cross-validation is not actually used to train the model, or preferentially would not be used to train the model, but instead just to find the ideal parameters for the training of the model, right, or at least refine, tell us some information about the refined possibility of subset of training parameters. The bootstrap is effectively a methodology by which we inform ourselves about the quality of that data set referential to the original core distribution. The reason why I say that it's relative to the core distribution is if we think about the sample space, right? Well, that's, I'm going to throw this away. I'm going to put my pocket throw it away. Um, it's the same brown. So in my other class, the brown one's the only one that works. <laughs> I, I grab it instinctively. So we think about the entire area, right? The entire space of the natural world. We can think about the sampling process of developing a data set as sort of randomly going through and selecting a few individuals from the space, right? So if we imagine that this, this set of individuals, right? So our, our sample it is a relationship to or a subset of omega, right? The entirety of the sample space, the whole, the whole possible effective universe of the system. So the sample as a subset could effectively be redrawn in this way, right? If I have a subregion, right? This is where my sample lives. Okay, now what I'm making an argument of is that my sample is a representative subset. Due to random selection, it will effectively be a microcosmic version of the whole cosmos, right? So think about it from this perspective. If you take any enclosed space and you say the matter within that enclosed space is largely representative of the universe, right? I say typically that's on Earth probably not so true because we're a little bit higher matter density than most of the rest of the universe, but the argument would be that any given closed space should be roughly representative. Now I say roughly representative, how representative is it? That's the key question, how representative is it? Because we know that ultimately most systems at the scale of omega, at the scale of the entire sample space, follow under what type of distributional characteristics? They fall underneath the normal distribution, right? Mm -hmm. Density tending to aggregate towards certain higher density regions and then falling off in certain directions. You can think about this as both energetic and density driven characteristics. So let's think about populational mechanics of individuals, because oftentimes the things we're doing with our machine learning models impact people. We want to quantitize the characteristics, behavior, elements of a population, and then make some sort of adjustment to the way in which we're interfacing with them. The argument here is 
I have a data set that's constructed from some of the people, right? Some of the people that do exist in the world. So if this is the actual distribution of omega, right? I have some other version of the distribution. This is the distribution S. It's not identical, but it's close, right? We would say that S, we'd say something like the standard deviation of omega and the standard deviation of S are approximately equal. Graphic delay. Approximately equal, right? They're not exactly the same, but they're close enough that we should be able to make some inference about what's actually happening in the natural world from that understanding of the system. So let me, let me put it to you in this perspective. This is a continuous distribution, or roughly thereof. True, truly no real continuous distribution exists because the universe in the perspective we're describing it does have finite characteristics to it. There are a certain number of humans, at least that we know of. Okay, so that while it is a big number, right, seven to eight billion, it's still a countable number, right? So effectively, if we were to say that the infinity span here is a countable infinity, right? This is very much a discretized system. The inferences we make about it are in fact, as I said previously, the consolidation of information about the actual samples that make up that group. So how do I determine how well this particular sample set reflects this one and how stably I can utilize that information in order to make certain decisions? Well, I'm gonna to try to describe it to you in this way. Let's imagine that we were in a neighborhood, right? And we're gonna go out and we're gonna do a survey. And along the edges of the street, we're going to have a series of little houses, right? And we're going to go along to a certain number of these houses, and we're going to collect the survey from them. This isn't like Jackson County taxes, is it? <laughs> no, it's much more ethical. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Whoa, strong political opinion. Not, not, not an unpopular one, though. Um, doesn't take any bravery to criticize people in the tax assessment space at the moment, right? Right. Okay, so I'm going through here and I'm going to start. Say what? They're just doing their job. They're just doing their exactly. 45 seconds a house. Yeah, that's, that's, that's mm -hmm, no. Okay, 45 seconds a house. Uh, let me comment on that briefly. What happens whenever you're incentivized by the same system that you assess? It's like showing you the training, the testing data set. Yeah. Okay? It's I, I'm, I'm, I'm exposing the internal works of the system. One of the biggest criticisms that I've seen recently is that if you are an assessor and you are also involved in the industry you're assessing, let's say your company owns stock in or is interested in the development of property in the space, wouldn't it behoove you to improve the property values of the adjacent areas in order to inflate the property values of your own properties that are adjacent? I mean, that's the question, whether or not they're being incentivized by their own methodology. You have to make sure that you're compartmentalizing your, your objectives. And it's the reason why the state auditor has come in and actually kind of frozen that perspective now. They're, they're saying that they're going to have to reassess it. Well, if they had a code of <laughs> ethics, they wouldn't well, have gotten They do. It's, it's uh, the ACM code of ethics because they're engineers. So, well, then um, they didn't follow the code. They did not follow the code. <laughs> so let's say that we went through here. We don't, sampling process says we can't go to every house. In truth, every house is not going to answer the door. So even if we did answer every single door, or we got an answer at every single door, it would still be impossible for us to collect it all. So let's just say that we decided to go through and do every other one. All right? So every other one is going to be kind of characterized within our data set. So now we've collected the samples here. I got to do that one as an adjacency because I kind of counted from the wrong end. But let's say those are our actual samples. Now let me make that. Let me make a little argument here. Make a little argument. What do we think that the difference between this sample and this sample is going to be? 
They're neighbors, right? They're neighbors. So likely they're going to have similar framework, ideological framework, right? So if we're doing a survey, house to house survey, just bear with me. Okay. Well, don't come to so, my street so. because it's already <laughs> blown up. All right. So similarly, similarly, the idea is that any individual within non hot button topics, okay? So let's not talk about strictly polarizing stuff. <laughs> Even within strictly polarizing stuff, we're we'll fine. It's still roughly a 50 50 offset, right? Got, got, got allegiances to most basic ideas. So let's just say that I was to want to understand another potential data set that imagined that I had gone and collected these households, right? Hmm. How would I do that? How do I imagine that I collected those, perhaps even instead of the other ones? Right? So I say, well, let's imagine that I didn't collect this one, right? But instead I did collect this one. Well, I don't actually have data for that house. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that since that random sample is likely to be adjacent to several other random samples in the space, what happens if I randomly duplicate another element from the system. What happens if I just randomly duplicate this guy down there? Let's say, ah, there's a, there's a, a likelihood, right, kind of a 50-50 shot, that that particular individual likely had very high correlate opinions with any other individual in the sample space, right? So I selected this guy to replicate. I also did the same thing with this one. I decided I don't want to collect this one, but I do want to collect these two, right? So I'm going to copy this one here, and I'm going to copy this one over here, right? I'm going to get rid of this one. The same number of samples as I did previously, but now I have what? Three copies of the original samples. Huh. What's going to happen to the distribution characteristics? There's going to be a slight difference, right? Just slight difference because we're doing what? We're doing something called oversampling. We're oversampling. We're actually taking this same sample and we're saying, well, instead of collecting this one out here, by assumption, we're just going to duplicate this one again. Okay? And duplicate this one again instead of this one. Duplicate this one again instead of this one. Right? We have the same number of samples within the data set, but we have a slightly different distribution with the assumption of, follow me here, kind of a parallel universe understanding of what could have happened had we actually selected different individuals to sample from the subset. So assuming that there is actually another individual here in this, in, within this original subspace that is actually relatively close and adjacent to the original sample of this group that was brought in to create the member of set S initially, <coughs> by duplicating that individual within the set, we're assuming that we collected another individual from Omega, right? We just, we collected another individual from Omega, it just happened to be largely adjacent to the original element of S. So we're going to get slight deviations, such that the first version of this sampling, right, so we have this version, first resampling version of it might have slightly different characteristics, maybe pushed to one edge, right? Maybe this one is sort of more pushed to this edge, right? Slight shifts, slight shifts. Imagine certain individuals on one end of the spectrum or other end of the spectrum with regard to some op opinion or idea, now sort of starting to create a higher population or a lower population. But on average, what's gonna happen? Relative to the mean of this system, they're going to be pretty close, right? Pretty close. Some of them are going to be right on the mean or right centered around the mean, and some of them are going to have slight tilts from one direction or the other. I'm going to show you a couple things. All right, so by definition, the bootstrap is a powerful statistical tool. Why is it not a machine learning tool or a, or a statistical learning tool? Because it's just an analysis tool, all right? It's a statistical tool in which we quantify uncertainty. What? 
quantify uncertainty, how can you quantify something you're not certain about? <laughs> Sounds totally antithetical to everything we think about, but we can actually quantify the uncertainty associated with a given estimator for our learning method framework. So I'm going to start off with first looking at the, the slide that I have that references this. And this is a supplemental. This is a supplemental slide. This is a supplemental slide. Shoot. Uh, All right, fine. Slide six. Supplemental okay. slide six. Okay. So um, we're going to look at this first one. I have to do this. We're going to look at this first example, and we're going to kind of walk through it a little bit. So we're going to work with uh, a bootstrap. We could work with bootstrap to sort of for one dimensional data. But I think a bootstrap for classification makes a little, a little, like it makes some of this make a little bit more sense, all right? The reason why I say it makes a little bit more sense initially is because we see two versions. We see two versions of each one each time, right? So essentially duplicating it for each of the classes sort of gets you to see two different versions of two different distribution samples in each case. So these are the original sample the actual, let's say this is the actual universe, all right? Notice, those are the, con the continuous distribution functions, PDFs, of the actual underlying population, all right? So that's the real, this is effectively the real world where we're sampling from. What's the next rational step of the process? We randomly sample individuals from that continuous distribution. We just freeze it, and we pick specific actual examples out of this initial distribution. So this is this is our data set. We start off with our data set, right? That's the one we got by sampling, reading individual samples from the, from the actual real world. And we want to do something with this that allows us to understand how well, effectively how well, this system is representative of a true, normal uh, version of the initial case distribution. Now, how would I say that? How would I determine that? Utilizing this methodology. Well, I notice that I have some set S here, right? We would then call the next S version of this S prime, right? It's the new version of the original sampling set that has been modeled by or created by selection with replacement. Okay? Most of the systems we've done thus far, the original sampling process is selection without replacement. Once an individual has been selected from the natural populace, becomes a member of the data set, right? we don't go and resample that person again. <clears throat> but we're going to utilize the power of actually being able to resample our data set to be able to determine what could have happened had we theoretically gone and selected different individuals the first time, right? The assumption is that if S is representative of omega, that S prime is also representative of omega. And S prime through S double prime through S m prime is going to be versions of possible worlds, right? Possible sort of parallel universes where we selected slightly different versions of the original samples from Omega, from the, from the original system, to make up our data set. Each one of these is going to be a potential theoretical representation of the original data set recompiled by novelly remixing and mixing and matching the actual samples from the sample, random sample data set. Okay? So we go over here and we look at this system. Let's zoom in a little bit. Notice, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, through theta n, there are slight differences between each one of those. Slight differences between each one of them, right? So the algorithm of the bootstrap actually attempts to try to maintain approximately a two-thirds to one-third representational offset. It says that one-third of the data should be re retained, and two-thirds of the data can be replicated meaning that it could be represented more than one time in the data set. So we try to keep a bare bones framework for the initial sampling, the initial sampling offset, and then oversample 
another third of the data. So we take one third and reserve it. We take another third, set it over here, and then we replicate samples from the one third again to end up with two thirds of them that have at least two versions of the same sample, and one third was part of the core sample set. <clears throat> Algorithmically, that's just sort of a retention mindset. It's, it's based upon the idea that random oversampling would potentially cause the same sample to be oh, sampled too many times. There's a possibility that the same sample could be sampled too many times. So we constrain that slightly. So we notice that they have a, a relatively similar construction, right? Their, their means and overall distributional characteristics are fairly uniform. But what also do we notice about them? They have some characteristic of the standard deviation, right? And we're going to establish from there, what do we have? We can develop the mean of all of these different distributions, right? Expected value for all of these different versions of the system. So we're gonna take the mean of all of the different possible versions of the original sample at resample with replacement. By that process, we effectively develop all of the different ways we could possibly have taken the data collection, right? All the ways the data collection could have gone. So we see the mean, which is what? That is the most frequent version of the distribution characteristics, right? So the standard deviation, variance of standard deviation, right? Variance in this case. So the mean of the variance of omega of a whole index of possible resample versions of this, the mean of it is that omega bar, or not, not omega bar, excuse me, theta bar, right? The mean of omega should converge to theta bar. That would be the ideal, right? The actual sample space, the, the, mean, of the, the, the mean of the assumed sample space and the mean of the bootstrap distribution should center around that same point. Why do we think that? You guys ever heard of the central limit theorem? How many of you have heard of it? Sounds familiar. Uh, we talked about it in 394, so if you haven't heard about it yet, it's not your fault. So, because <laughs> you're in your control. The central limit theorem states that as any system of subsamples tends toward infinity, that distribution tends toward a normal distribution centered upon the mean of that system. Right, the accumulative average. So the idea here is that as I keep resampling, I'm creating multiple synthetic versions of possible data sets that could have been selected. So what I'm doing is I'm actually creating a new version each time that I resample, each time that I bootstrap. And by the composite of those, by adding all of them together, by characterizing all of them in sequence with one another, what do we end up with? We end up with the average deviation, right? And then we end up with deviations leaning in both directions away from that actual core deviation. We actually end up with a deviation and deviations. Right, do we understand what that means? Yes. Well, go ahead and finish, quick question. Okay, there's more to it than this, but, but yeah, I'm good there. What are you um, so we're finding the mean of X1 and X21, and then we're averaging those together? Uh, or how are we comparing? Let's, let's, look, let's look at the notation first. All right, so notationally, Oh, so X1, one is X1, the X1, one, one, X2, one right, then x1 of 2, x2 of 2, right? So effectively, these are the distributional characteristics of the first class and the second class at that relevant sample number. So the first one is the class number, the second is the sample number. Okay. So that theta one corresponds to whichever the bootstrap number is. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so it's not an additional dimensionality. It's the same, it's the same feature, the same Class feature data set is just a new, it's a new re representation of it. Let me show you guys the animated version of this on, uh, on C theory. 
Okay, so let's, uh, I, I love seeing theory. If you guys have not done this website, it is like, explains everything. Seeing theory? Yeah, this is this website is called Seeing Theory. I've put links to it in the room before, so. That's why it looks familiar. Okay, so let's assume we have a normal distribution in the initial case. Let's first start off by grabbing a sample of that normal distribution. Notice what happens. I've got a sample of it. Hmm. It's okay. It doesn't perfectly represent the underlying space, but it's okay, right? It's fairly, fairly normalized. So let's try a process. Let's try the bootstrap. Let's try to resample the sample. Huh. It gives me the first mean. Let's try it again. Let's see what happens. Oh, they're still, both of those are along the same line. Oh, well, that one's actually at a slightly different mean. Oh, that one has a, a similar mean to the last one. Oh, we still, we're moving over even further because of how we're duplicating. Let's watch it resample several of them. Resample it 100 times. Resample it 100 more times. Notice what happens. The strength of this system is effectively going to attempt to do what? It's going to converge around the original mean of the resample distribution, such that it starts to reference or starts to reflect an underlying normal distribution, right? So let's increase the number of samples we're doing in the original system and try to see if we can get one that centers roughly approximately around the center of the actual distribution system. That should do pretty well. Let's try this one. Okay, that actually works pretty good. But by ex expanding it, right, what we have, Multiple different representations, each one of these, its own individual representation of the original sample distribution. So the resampled version then takes the average or the expectation of the average value, okay? And develops it from the sample underlying sample system. Bootstrapping process develops for us a new quantitized distribution that we call the confidence interval. Let's go look at that again real quick. This bootstrap distribution starts off with what? The mean of all of the sample distributions developed by the, re by the resampling. Then we had what? We had certain samples that had their means were slightly higher or slightly lower than each of those sample numbers, right? What this represents is a possible, sort of possible future in which if the right number were selected, if the right version of the sample selected from the actual underlying population were to come about, you would have what? You would have your data set would reflect that mean, okay? So had things gone slightly differently, your sample could have had a mean anywhere within this space. Assuming that that sample was actually reflective of the true population, right? Assuming this sample is reflective of this whole population, when I resample, what I'm doing is I'm actually creating a slight jitter, a slight jitter around the initial space. So let's say that this is S originally, right? And this one here is going to be S prime. And this one here is S double prime. Or we could write these as S11, or is S1, this is just the core sample. This is S1, and this is S2, right? So we say 1, 1, and uh, 1, 2, right? Because we don't have two classes. What do we do? We said, I'm going to jitter the, I'm gonna jitter the samples around, and I'm going to effectively say that if this one's close to this one, Right, or this one's close to some other one in the system, then I'm gonna imagine what it would have been like had I done this sample, right? This is gonna be S11, right? Then the other one is I jittered and I selected a slightly different version of it, right? This is now S12, okay? Imagine that I do this a bunch of times. Right? And I continue on with the process. Imagine all these little circles that are created by the random resampling process. 
Knowing that initially they were randomly sampled from the whole of the pop, what happens? By that jittery process and replication of some of the subset samples, what do I do? I get different possible versions that could have occurred as S from omega. The idea is that I can work back to a better and more general understanding of how well the subset that I selected is reflective of the core population by resampling it, successively resampling it with replacement and creating a large repository of possible versions that could have happened had I sampled it slightly differently with the knowledge that any given sample is effectively so similar to any other given sample within the system that I could replicate it and it would only be a slight deviation from the actual version of the sample that would have occurred had I selected from actual other individuals in the initial process of sampling. I like the word sample and selection is in there a lot, so I hope it made sense to you. <laughs> How small of a deviation are we talking about? Or would we expect to see for a reliable? It really kind of depends on the perspective. So we remember previously when we were discussing the idea that having sort of an over-under on what we expected for the absolute performance maximum of a system was helpful to us. This confidence interval is similar to that statistical confidence interval framework for a regression assessment in the fact that it provides us with sort of how well we expect to be able to do at representing the actual real world, right? So if I build a model using this, right, how well do I expect it to represent that? Any, any inference I'm making with it will have distributional characteristics like this, right? Some other given subset. So let's imagine that this is, this is our training set X, right? Let's imagine that our testing set is over here. Right? Testing set is technically a different version of omega. Yeah. So as a result, that testing set will probably be what? Reflective of one of these possible population characteristics within the system. And any given sample that I effectively run the model on, what's going to happen to it? It's likely going to be within the range of one of those sample spaces. So the tighter this space is, what do we have? The tighter the space is, we assume a lower internal variance. We assume that the data doesn't spread out very heavily. Because when we resampled it, it means that almost all of those points were relatively adjacent to one another, such that the means, the expected values of those distributions, didn't change too much. So the standard deviation of this, alpha, is the deviation and deviations as a result of a composite of multiple different versions of sort of possible universes. You guys seen Doctor Strange, right? You remember when he's he, at the end of uh, Doctor Strange, he gets the, the pendant, you can see the future, and then he goes into the Infinity War, right? Yeah, where he goes all to all those futures, right? He's sitting there and he's seeing, I saw 14 million futures or whatever, right? That's it, that's a bootstrap. <coughs> Subtle changes, subtle little DOMs. This thing had gone slightly differently, right? The matrix again, you know, did it break the break the uh, the, the base, right? If I hadn't said anything, all right. These are each one of these is a possible world in which I collected a slightly different version of the data set, and it is coherent with the assumption that any given rep, any given value, any given individual sample, as long as it's only replicated a, a reasonable number of times, then it's reasonable to assume that the dynamics of that data set should also be reflective of the whole of the system. So effectively, this ends up allowing us to work back to an understanding of the distribution of the original system and give us a degree of confidence in our decision-making processes. I'll also show you how this process works for prescriptive outcome in a little bit, but I wanna talk through that first. So if you need a visualization of this, right, the original data set is this distribution up above, right? And then individual bootstraps of it are selections with replacement of the original distribution. This is another version, yet again, original sample, and then a bootstrap including, we notice here that we have three blue and three yellow. What does that require? Well, we got three blues, right? So we can have all three of them are blue. 
right? So it could all be the original samples. Or one of those blues could be a duplicate of one of the other blues. Notice we actually don't have enough yellows. So we must assume that at least one is a replica of one of the other yellows. We could assume that we've just selectively reduced the oranges by one. We only picked one of two oranges, right? And we either replicated a green or took both green. Both versions, both and versions exist in that system. All relevant permutations of the subselection and replication potentially exist in the space. So you could have thousands of bootstraps in a large enough system before you start to converge to a reliable resample of the system such that we understand its internal dynamics. Yes? But from the slide that you did before on this one with all the dots, it, yeah. would, take, it would take all of those samples on the bottom mm -hmm. one top and average it out and then give us that. It would try to, it would try to take the understanding that's gleaned from each of these versions of the bootstrap mm -hmm. and then attempt to understand the dynamics of the actual underlying distribution mm -hmm. such that the bootstrap, right, would be reflective of this original data, all right? So notice something. Original data is not actually re referencing back to the actual real world. So this is the real world system. Mm -hmm. the, this is the sample, right? So this is sample of the real world, discretized version. Each of these are starting from sample going to bootstrap, right? But the goal is that the bootstrap would be reflective of the actual thing that is above all of this, above the sample itself. In the real world, or the sample space from which that sample was extracted from. The idea then being that we can effectively expand our understanding of the sample space out beyond the actual parameters of the true sample space to imagine varying sort of jittered versions of that sample being recollected. And if we do that enough times, we'll get a confidence, or, or excuse me, enough, enough samples to be confident that on average, on average, the sample has this mean, right? Notice here what's happening in this space. How many, what is this, what is the height of this representing? This is representing how many bootstraps have this mean, right? This is representing how many bootstraps have this mean, this mean, this mean, this mean, right? It effectively indicates that the whole thing has, shift, has shifted, been pushed, sort of pushed around by the resampling. If you imagine the little ping pong balls coming down, there's one that sort of all of them fall over here, and then all of them fall over here, and then all of them fall over here. Most of them tend to do what? Tend to fall relatively toward that center. But a few will fall in the upper category, and a few fall in the lower category. Let me give you an example of this. I think will actually make some sense. I want you guys to think through it. But it's part of the, uh, the, the core slides. Um, by the way, this comes from a, a story uh, the Adventures of Baron Mount Munchausen that has the idea that a guy gets trapped in a well and uh, he or fall, he falls to the bottom of a lake and he grabs himself by the bootstraps and pulls himself out. Okay, what does the bootstrap mean? It means that you work with what you've got. Okay, you just you 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 pull yourself up by the bootstrap. It's a term that is used in business. So if you ever use, if you ever see it used, it often reflects self-funding or internal process development where you're not relying on external you know, system grants or whatever, you're using the resources you already have to do the best you can with what you've got. Bootstrap is similar. So let's start about this example. Suppose we wish to invest a fixed sum of money in two relevant financial assets. Let's, uh, let's call these stocks at the moment. These assets have a yield return for two random variables, X and Y. That is effectively how much money we're making. When I say yield return, what can yield return be? It can either be positive or negative, right? You can either gain money or lose money on an individual stock. So imagine that you have two stocks where X and Y are relevant, relevantly random quantities with increasing or decreasing characteristics. We want to invest a fraction of some numerical characteristic that we'll call alpha. That is the total amount of money that we have to invest, all right? That's actually what we derive from the bootstrap. So by that process of alpha, we get the relative spread in each of the values of x and y. So what do we see in these cases? Let's go back, I'm gonna go back to the other slide and we're gonna look at this one. Let's note, if we say that instead of this being x, x and x2, right? Let's say this is x and y. 
let's say that we sampled these, and this is the period of, of sampling, right? So let's say we had a 10-year window. Within that 10-year window, the average of that stock stayed roughly around zero, right? It didn't, it didn't gain or gain, uh, lose value. But sometime during that 10-year period, it had a period of loss, right? And these were the times that it lost money, right? These were the individual cyclic periods in which the stock actually went down. And then this was the cyclic periods in which the stock went up. Likewise for Y, periods of when it went up and periods where it went down. So if I utilize the bootstrap, what am I doing? I'm being, being Dr. Strange, imagining all the possible future universes based upon the past information in which what? The likelihood of X to increase in value and the likelihood of Y to increase in value, they have their own individual likelihoods, some quantity, some relationship to increase or decrease in value. So what we're going to do, and this is we're going to come back to this on Friday. So I said I'm just setting up the setting up the pins so that you guys can think this think, think it through. Is we want to choose some value alpha such that we minimize this relationship, the variance of this whole equation system, right? A uh, alpha of x, right? What is alpha? Alpha is the amount of money that I want to invest in the first stock, right? And then one minus alpha is all the money minus however much we put in the first stock. Okay? So I want to minimize the relationship of risk. We want to minimize risk. And what happens when we minimize risk? We maximize potential for reward. So I figure out which of the stocks is the riskiest. And I make that the second investment. And I take the one that's the solid in the first case. Right? What is it indicating? It's indicating which stock has the highest likelihood to increase in value and which has the lowest likelihood to increase in value, I'm going to spread my money across both of them in order to attempt to maximize the possibility of getting a positive reward in the system and minimize the likelihood of losing money in the outcome. Bootstrap will allow us to do this. We'll talk about how we do that in calculation. And, and then we'll transition into discussing uh, the fun uh, principal component analysis and reprojections. So I will be coming out with, uh, there will be two labs. We're going to do a lab five and a lab six. They're going to be a little shorter. You're not going to have to work with your own data sets on these because it's a little harder to work with data sets <laughs> on these. Okay, they get weird. you got to have good, you got to sort of curate I thought that was the longest part of the lab so far is finding know, the right data. I know, but these ones I'm actually going to avoid that right now because I've been having a hard time being able to figure out other good alternatives. So we're just going to utilize uh, we're going to use, use your, your student ID as a seed so that everybody will be able to produce their own versions of these. So okay. If you use okay. the seeding, you can use your own student ID, and you can work through that. All right, so I'll talk to you guys on Friday. Thank you.